Bibles up and turn with me to the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 5. Mark 5. I'm going to start at verse 21. Read to the end of the chapter. Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? Jesus looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear. Only believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John. John's the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, Jesus saw a commotion. People wailing and weeping loudly. When Jesus had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child's not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then Jesus put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Jesus took her by the hand and said to her, Talibethka, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. It said that C.S. Lewis walked in on an academic discussion about the distinctiveness of Christianity. Those present were about to decide that there was nothing that set Christianity apart from any other world religion. Simply because they were unable to come up with anything that truly marked our faith and set it apart from the rest. So they put the question to Lewis. He paused only a moment and then said, that's easy. It's grace. Grace. My friends, grace is what makes us who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Grace is what motivates us to respond with love and joy and hope. Grace is what equips us for living in this world and what allows us to help create a sense of community as we seek, as we seek out other recipients of God's grace. Grace is what we have to offer the world. Nothing of our own, but the gifts that come from grace. It's grace. That's what Paul's talking about 
in 2 Corinthians that Mark shared with you. Now, he's talking about it in a rather complicated way. I'll give him that. It, it, and this is often thought of as Paul's stewardship campaign sermon, is what's written to the Corinthians. As often uh, it, it is when money is discussed, Paul uh, talks around it in such a way that you just might miss what he's saying. You see, Paul's taken up a collection for the church in Jerusalem. The growth was out in the suburbs. These small towns throughout the countryside were, or where the disciples were going to and starting up churches. And there was a lot of success out there. But what about that home church in Jerusalem? It was having a hard time. Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches in Macedonia. For during a sort of severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And so Paul went from church to church asking for mission giving. And the churches responded. Paul's proud of them for giving. Some of them gave, even though they themselves were struggling. They still gave. And now he comes back to Corinth, a church that Paul has struggled with, a church with a few problems and some dissension, but he still invites the people there to give. He invites them to participate. He writes, now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in the utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. Generous undertaking. Kind of sounds like a telethon classic buttering people up before asking them for something kind of phrase, doesn't it? You know, like, Flattering them before you jump in with the ask, you know, the bill. But that isn't what Paul does here. The last two words of the verse that I share translate, are translated in our Bible as generous undertaking. Paul wants them to excel, he says. He wants them to excel, to participate, to enjoy this generous undertaking. But the Greek words for that we are, have translated as generous undertaking... Our cherished Peruso, which I would translate differently. You know I'm different. I know oftentimes people have said that. Mark, you said that. So uh, thank you for that. But uh, in a loving way. I'm a little different. I translate it differently because I think there's a more direct meaning here. Generous undertaking really should be abounding grace. I want you to participate in this abounding grace. All right? You can translate it just like that. The invitation is not to give, but to participate in grace, abounding grace. Paul goes on to explain that this is what Jesus did for us by emptying himself, giving up, and giving away that we might know glory. That we might know hope and salvation. That we might be able to give grace away. Because we have received it. And we have so much we can give it away. We will not lack. Paul's trying to tell the Corinthians that he's doing for them a favor by letting them give. And he knows that they, just like us, my friends, want to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I know that grace. And not only can you know it, but you can live it. Not only can you receive it as a gift. No, you can activate it by giving it away. By participating in those ripples of grace that go from person to person, from community to community. And bring transformation and an experience of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul concludes the invitation by reminding us that love needs proof from time to time. Love needs action to really be love. 
At least the love that Christ calls us to. The love that God expresses. And the most famous verse of all reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave. The action was he gave his only son so that everyone, you and me, who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Our scripture from the gospel according to Mark tells us it's Jesus who is our example of grace. It's Jesus who is our example of grace, or better yet, our example of giving what you have. Jesus seizes the moment. He responds to the need and is fully present with those who come to him, even though there is interruption in the midst of it all. Hey, interruption. Hey, he's interrupted all the time. Isn't he? Doesn't the gospel show that? I wonder if, uh, you know, I'm crazy like that. I wonder if Jesus ever got frustrated with the interruptions. It seems that time after time, someone comes running up to Jesus when he's doing something and changes his course. Stops in right at what he's doing and has to do something else. And I know Jesus is ready to help. And in my mind, I know he's ready to heal and to go where he's most needed. But still, the demands of the crowd wanting something from him must have been like barking dogs getting on his last nerve. It must have been. But here's a fact. Here's a fact. I've looked into the Gospels. I've looked at the Gospels. I've read them over and over, my friends. And there ain't no frustration in them. There's no frustration in Jesus. There seems to rather be an infinite supply of patience. An infinite supply that he could draw on. Jesus was grace incarnate. And you might be thinking, and it's rightly so, Tim, of course he was. And of course he is. But my point is, this is my point, as followers of Christ, as Christians, those who are trying to live Christ's life, we are to be grace incarnate as well. Giving though they don't deserve. Loving though they haven't earned it. That they can't earn it. Not just to see the needs, to see the people or opportunity as interruptions. But rather to see these interruptions through Christ-like eyes as grace moments. To give and to receive, to be attentive and to be present. To be alive and real, like Christ was, and like Christ is still today. Like they always say in my favorite infomercial, and that's not all. That's not all. Oh no. There's more here than the interruption. In our story today, and you've got to love it, there is healing, there's acceptance, there is life out of death, there is hope. There are 12 years of a downward spiral leading to rock bottom. And there are tw uh, 12 years of young life that seem to be vanishing like the morning mist. There's a daughter reclaimed from shame and suffering. And there is a daughter reclaimed from death. There is wonder and there is laughter. Both before and after Jesus come into the picture. There is a lot here. It's a lot. I also like that there's a secret. Y'all like a secret? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love a secret. I love a good mystery. Jay, you know that. You know I love a good mystery. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, why does Jesus here tell them not to tell anyone when they're, when, the, when you know they, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to tell people. I've always told everyone, I said, if I want everyone in the church to know, I'm going to talk about it at a PPR committee meeting. 
Yeah, those are supposed to be the secret committee meetings. Yeah, yeah, whatever, <laughs> whatever. I might as well tell everyone right here. Saves time. Because you just, some things you just can't help but share, right? I mean, here's something, all right? Because I'm positive this would, this would be a changer right here. When you undo a funeral that's already started by raising the dead person to life, there's going to be some questions that need to be answered. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I have been to a load of funerals, and I'm positive. First off, after you resuscitated me, all right, because I'd probably fall down a little bit, I'd say glory, and poo. So that's a glory moment. <laughs> but this seems like an odd thing to do, right? They're going to tell. They're going to tell. Why wouldn't Jesus tell them not to say anything? When he knows their heart, he knows what we're like. Unless. Oh, I got it for you. I got the answer for you, Mark, right here. What if the commandment wasn't not to tell, but rather Jesus was saying, it's not your story to tell, it's hers. It's hers. She owns it. The only ones in the room were the little girl's parents and those three disciples. Maybe Jesus wanted the story to be the little girl's story, not theirs. Sure, they could tell that they were around when this happened, but she can prove it. <laughs> I always wonder if this is where Jesus is setting the precedent for witnessing. Tell your own story is what Jesus is saying here. Don't tell someone else's story about when you were touched by me. Tell that story, your story, of when Jesus touched your heart. Don't tell them about whenever Jesus touched your pastor's heart or Brian's heart or Jade's heart. Tell them whenever Jesus touched your heart and brought you to life. That's powerful. Powerful. Now I've lost my place. <laughs> why don't you just... Yeah, why don't I just look down, huh? Maybe. Tell it with your... It's okay. Take care. Tell your story with your living rather than words, at least at first. Give her something to eat, Jesus says. It's like he's saying... In those words, sweet little girls, show them you're alive. You're really alive. You're hungry. You've been in bed for a bit. And then, while you're sitting there eating, tell them how you're alive. Tell them how. I like Mark's gospel. I like it. I like these sandwich stories he makes. He starts telling one story, and boom, right in the middle, it's another slice of something. Just as juicy. And then he finishes the story he started. Love it. Love it. Oh man, I do. So we got just, this is just nuggets for me of goodness. Jairus, we know, is a leader of a synagogue right there, Mark tells us. That gives him some status. That puts a certain aura about him. Jairus is a person others would go to. He's a decider. He's a determiner. He has resources, he has position, he has power. And I'm sure he is used to solving his problems. And not only that, any problems that are brought to him, he can solve. He's a make it happen kind of man. Except in this case. Except this one. My little daughter, he says. She's 12 years old, almost an adult. She's marriageable age. Ready to move out and move on. They got married early back then. But at the point of death, my friends, instead of being a young woman ready to move on, start her own life, no. She becomes his little daughter again. His little girl again. Lay your hands on her. Jarius asks, bless her, ordain her, set her apart, heal her, he asks. Save her, is what he's asking. 
The word that we translate here as ask is sozo, S-O-Z-O. It's sometimes translated as healed, but other times it's translated as saved. As in Jairus asking, save her. Save her. So that she may be able to be made well and live. Not just made well, but live. Live. He asked that Jesus bless her with the fullness of life and give her all that's in store for her, the, her potential, the goodness, the glory of God. Let her shine, he's asking. Now, ask is the wrong word. Sozo, that's, that's good, but it's not the right word. It also means begs. Jairus begs. He begs on his knees, his face down in the dust, clinging to Jesus' ankle, begging for him to come. You know what it takes for a proud man to get down on his knees and beg? Think about it. That's a good story. But Jarius becomes a follower that day. He changes. He becomes alive. He hadn't been a follower before as far as we know, but I guarantee he is now. Because he interrupted the interruptible Jesus and he pleaded for help. Hmm. Let me wrap this up. My friends, being a Christian isn't easy. Has anyone ever told you that? I've told you that. Don't act like no one's ever told you. You could have raised your hand. Goodness, Jade. Patty almost did, but she was doing that. <laughs> Stacy, I would have thought you'd pull in. I just think being a Christian is tough, and it's tougher when we try to do it alone. Do you hear me? It's tougher when we try to do it alone. We need help. We can't lead a Christian life alone. We can't live a Christian life alone. We have to have help. We need Jesus' help. So let's pray for it. Let's pray for that help today. These stories tell us he likes to be interrupted. He's got abundant patience and overflowing grace. Let's pray for that in our lives today. Pray with me. Lord, lay your hands on us this day. Bless us. Bless all we encounter. Use our hands. Use our knees. Use whatever it takes to save us, to make us well, and make us alive in you. And then we can learn to give what we have received. Grace upon grace. That grace that sets us apart. Your grace. Freely given, not earned. Your grace, Lord, this we beg of you, Lord. Amen. Amen.